Hey everybody, welcome to um, welcome to Nye Tech Ed New York Technology Educators uh, Hangout uh, on flipping your class or flipped instruction with Jasper Fox. And uh, we have Jasper Fox who's going to tell us all about um, his path on flipped instruction and his unique brand of flipping, which is not as typical as you might think. Uh, while you're in the Hangout, please uh, be courteous of the people who are speaking and keep yourself muted until you're going to speak so that way nobody goes large screen. And with that, I am going to um, waste no time and introduce our featured participant, Jasper Fox. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Jennifer, for the kind introduction. And thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us. I'm super excited to talk with you today about how I use video um, instruction in my class, in my everyday class routine, um, and you know, take you through a little bit about how I got started with it, uh, some of the tools and techniques that I use, um, some of the philosophical background to um, using this type of instruction, and then I'd like to leave some time at the end, obviously, or ongoing for any questions that you have. Uh, Jennifer had opened up a Today's Meet. Um, the URL is in the, in the chat box. You can join us there. And you can also um, continue the conversation that uh, Jennifer told me is going to be open for a week. And then you can also um, contact me at any time on Twitter, and I'll be happy to uh, continue the conversation there as well. Because um, I look at this as not a static you know, presentations, but this is more the beginning of what I hope is a great continuing conversation on this powerful teaching tool. So uh, Jennifer had really asked me to begin with how I got started with this. So I'll give you, um, you know, the, the philosophical aspect of this is uh, really comes to light at the end of the year. Um, I teach Earth's, Re Regents Earth Science and General Eighth Grade Science. And as you may know, those both have um, summative exams at the end of the year uh, that are, you know, have a lot of content in them. And oftentimes teachers really struggle to fit all that content in before the end of the year. Um, so I'm sure in every school around the area and across the country and, you know, wherever there's summative exams, teachers are struggling to fit that content into um, you know, before, before those exams. And oftentimes, uh, quite tragically, um, some content isn't discussed or delved into for lack of time. So where this really came from for me was those days, I've been teaching for 10 years, and um, I'd say for the first five years, I was a traditional teacher with a technological twist. So I was someone who um, incorporated United Streaming a little bit, but in a more direct instruction method, um, you know, the smart boards, stuff like that, um, but always in more of a traditional manner. And I relied on doing like a lecture on Monday and a, and a quiz or a test on Friday. And I'd say probably about my fifth year of teaching, I really started thinking really philosophically about how much valuable time that was wasting. So um, that's where I really got interested in the possibility of, you know, sort of taking the direct instruction piece and decoupling it with, uh, from class time. So that's sort of the philosophy of, you know, the, all those all those days of, of sitting there with 30 students, you know, and um, them taking a test or a quiz and just really thinking about what a waste of time that is, the valuable time. Um, then on a more humorous note, um, in 2011 and Hurricane Irene, um, right before school started, uh, my basement flooded. And in my basement was my huge uh, file folders of uh, worksheets for both my Regents of Science and my Science 8, and they were destroyed. Um, and I took that as a great opportunity to um, sort of rebrand my style of teaching. Um, and I took, you know, instead of sort of getting really upset and, and um, feeling sorry for myself, um, I'd been experimenting a little bit with some videos before, the, the year before, um, 
and you know I took that opportunity to say to myself I can really this is a great opportunity to 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 really change what I'm how I'm doing things and I so I digitized all of my resources um, and I can provide you with some examples of that in a little bit um, but then I also started doing um, my video instruction so you know sort of a humorous a humorous uh, anecdote but really meaningful because um, it really you know forced me to change what I'm doing um, so that was that was sort of the the start of it um, as I went forward um, so what I'd been working on with digitizing my resources previously was sort of creating a web repository of of resources and things so I first the first uh, thing that people who are do doing this need to consider is what platform you're going to use for the videos um, you know and really even before you start considering how you're going to make them you have to make sure that um, the videos can be viewed on any computer um, or any device uh, so and that was one of the first things that I ran into um, that I had to, to troubleshoot was um, you know coming up with a good solution for the ease of, of viewing because I didn't want anybody to have any excuses that they couldn't couldn't view the videos um, so I chose YouTube and that was uh, my first year and a half I used my own YouTube channel um, and then uh, the school district I work with uh, work for Lakeland schools um, had you know opened up an educational channel so that the students could watch the videos also at school so that that worked really well at first um, but there were some sort of technology technological challenges with using YouTube um, I don't know how many of you use YouTube for your school um, districts um, but it's actually not something I would generally recommend um, for a couple reasons one is um, with the suggested videos at the end that's one and then it's kind of a pain to moderate the comments and then you know it's it's kind of not really that hip to disable the comments uh, so there's you know there's some some challenges with that um, but you really want to make sure if you're embarking on uh, creating some video content to really make sure that it's accessible to everybody uh, something that I've been using this year which has been really great and it's available through the lyric is the ensemble video platform um, and really really happy with that and I can talk a little bit more about that as we go um, so that's a little bit about how I got started um, and I, I really think it's important to talk about it at you know now at the end of the year when um, everybody's studying for those exams um, you know for me in my classes we've been having in-class review for the Regents which is next Friday we've been reviewing for three weeks now so the way I like to look at it is I gain two days every every week um, of class time with my students um, now that's really really important because most teachers lament the fact that they're just constantly losing time you know because they have to either teach over and over and over again or um, you know they're just relying on a, on a more of an old-fashioned direct instruction method so I hope this is sort of resonating a little bit right now um, if anybody has any questions definitely be happy to answer any you know as, I, as I'm talking a little bit um, but that's sort one. of like how I got started. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about creating your videos, the very first videos that you made and you were using them in YouTube, how did you go about having your students consume them? Because I know that you actually do a lot of the video reviewing either in class with your students now or at night uh, video conferencing as well. So what was the first step though? Like what were the expectations you had of your students? What were they supposed to do with the videos and what did they do as a result when they came back into class? Um, well my initial videos were not the typical screencast videos that you probably most people associated with flip learning. Um, it was a very simple um, observations of clouds over a few days and um, 
I was, I was demonstrating what happened with when a, when a warm front came in and how you could tell when it's going to rain in a couple days. Um, so I took a video and I narrated it and I used a flip camera. Um, and I put it, I was, I was at that point I was using, I, I, I initially experimented with a, um, a blogger blog and the students were to go on there and it was really a more of a piloting it to see what they, what they thought of it. Um, and what I, what I learned was that QuickTime video is not, you know, you have to have like a, a web service for it. Um, because you know, the feedback I got was at least half of the kids couldn't view it. So it was really good feedback and just really more than, more than like what I expect them to do now with the videos. It was more just piloting it to see, could they view it? Um, you know, because I knew that they'd be excited about it because it's so different. Um, but that actually is a, is another good point um, that also couples in with when you're talking about um, the the video platform is something that's almost equally as important is the um, hosting space. Uh, you know, I don't really recommend having kids just go to YouTube, go to your YouTube channel. I don't think that's really the right, I don't know, I just don't feel like there's so much distraction going on there. So um, I feel like it's really important to have, you know, your, your district sponsored uh, teacher website or, you know, a video page. Again, I can give you some examples a little bit later, but, um, you know, th th this whole framework um, needs to be in place before you expect the kids to go and watch the videos. So I don't know, did, did that answer your question or? Yeah, you did, because I was looking for the initial steps that somebody would take yeah. um, if they were looking into flipping. So would you also suggest then, if you have a teacher that already has a well-established website and simply just wanted to embed, this came up in today's meet, uh, just wanted to embed the videos there in a blog on their site, then the commenting can take place on the blog itself. You still would get the suggested videos if you used YouTube as a host. But that's one kind of workaround that's not perfect, yeah, yeah. but it's a workaround. Yeah, you would embed you would embed using the HTML code, and that you know that that would work fine. Um, that would that would be fun, that would be fine. But again, it's it's you really you really want to make it. It's like any web design or any business plan or anything like that. You want to make it as easy as possible for your consumer, your student, to. Um, you know, to, to get to this content and to view it in a meaningful way. And anybody else who wants to chime in and ask chat Jasper a question, feel free. I'm just ask, acting as host and moderator here. Um, oh, for a second I thought Paul was raising his hand. Uh, so Jasper, why don't you talk about the first expectations then you had of your students. So the first step you had was for them to go and um, observe this video talking about how you can tell a warm front is coming in. Um, how did you mature your lessons from that point? Because you started off just showing them videos. So what is, in the beginning, what was it for you to have them consume the videos? What was the expectation in the classroom? And now what is it like for you? Um, well, initially it, was, initially it was really like, you know, that, so that was like May when I did the weather video. The next year when I started, I started right from the beginning. And um, I, I started it as, um, like a demonstration about a lab that I'd be doing and um, then the students could watch that video and then come into class the next day and know what they were doing because I found that I found that a lot of the times students would spend the first um, you know 10 or 15 minutes when we were doing a lab trying to figure out what they were supposed to be doing um, so my initial experiments with that really were just amazing. Uh, the first lab that I do in Regents Earth Science is finding the density of unknown liquids. And usually that results in a couple broken graduated cylinders and some water and cooking oil on the floor because the students don't know what they're doing or, you know, they're, they just are still figuring it out, you know. And the fact that they were able to see me calculate the density of different unknown liquids um, and sort of visualize it and then from whenever they watched it the night before to class um, you know they were able to process it and think about it and so the first year that I did this um, was you know th there was there was no broken glass there was no spills 
And as I was going around and informally assessing my class uh, and all the students, they were all getting uh, acceptable answers. So um, in terms of, in terms of um, phil philosophy of, of, you know, checking on them and making sure they're watching the videos, I don't really subscribe to that idea. Um, it's partially because I have really high expectations for my students in that I expect them to be doing what they are supposed to be doing um, without me constantly hanging over their shoulder and, you know, double checking on them. So, you know, la last, the last year, last school year, uh, so that was 2011, 2012, um, that was the first full year that I was using my videos. And I actually never assigned any videos. Um, and at the end of the year, I did an anonymous student survey, and only 1% of my students said that they didn't watch the videos. So the expectation level was really high. Um, I made the videos and the content meaningful. Um, and, you know, the students, since this is so such meaningful instruction, they responded by watching it. And uh, if I'm remembering off the top of my head, it was like, 10 or 15 or even 20 percent actually said they watched um, they watched them many more times than were even required. Most of them said they watched the videos once and that's you know that's fine um, but many more of them said that they watched a lot more. Um, Sabrina I see that you uh, just asked a question. Uh, my work with the ensemble video platform has sort of spawned into quite a few teachers in my school and district starting to use the ensemble um, playlist and um, you know sort of giving maybe video opportunities that their students had before um, a broader audience so that's pretty exciting and then um, I'm working out for next year I'm going to be giving some professional development opportunities for my colleagues in my district um, because you know as word is sort of getting out um, you know, I, I do have a lot of stuff I can I can offer, and I really enjoy being a helpful um, participant with uh, with other teachers and helping them use this powerful tool. So, and I'm hoping that um, some of those professional development opportunities I can actually incorporate live streaming. So I'll be definitely willing to share the uh, the link. You know, if I, if that opportunity does come along um, with this group. Jasper, now you had, um, that, so that was the beginning when you had your students and you didn't even require them to watch the video. And now you have a practice that's a little bit different. Do you want to talk about uh, the current practice that you do or the weekly sure. after hours meetings? Sure. I, I actually still don't require the students to watch the videos. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it, it has, it, you know, before we get into that, it has a lot to do with, with you know, just my style of teaching where I'm, I'm expecting the students to take responsibility for their learning. And I think that's a commonality across, you know, teachers that use this style of instruction. Um, but sometimes I found last year that video could be really isolating for students. And I always try to put myself in a student's position and, and take their perspective. And, you know, I, I've been wondering what, you know, what would a student do if they had a question, you know, or they didn't understand something or, you know, if they, you know, and, and they're home with their computer and so, you know, what do they do? So this year I started um, incorporating something a little more that I had been experimenting last year, uh, which is called asynchronous, I call it asynchronous class time. So what this does is it basically I give a list of um, activities for the week and it's basically what we would do on a normal week anyway and it's I break it into levels and basically the way that works is students can sort of start picking and choosing when they want to do certain activities and what this does for me is it allows me to have the students watch the videos in class if they want. Um, and something so so basically what it does is it it basically makes it so I have a lot less homework than I'm assigning um, 
and you know the students can then watch in class and if they pause it and they can ask me a question you know live so that's been something that's really really been very powerful um, this year and I know that students really appreciate the opportunity because you know students these days and people in general are so busy um, I don't really think it's fair to assign something today that has to be done tomorrow um, you know and if I was too busy to do it I'm gonna get it get uh, penalized for it so you know that goes the same with with videos so uh, the videos are available you know like a few days before they might actually even need them um, so that you know there's there's a lot more latitude in my classroom um, and that encourages students to take more ownership and be more much more autonomous in their learning uh, Jennifer had mentioned my online office hours and this is something that I'm so excited about this is some this is the second year that I was working with uh, evening office hours and um, I was basically taking a page from any webinar experience that you may have had um, and I basically give my students an experience that's like that is a webinar so I use the Adobe Connect platform and it's just so exciting uh, because basically what I get to do is I get to upload I upload a video beforehand and I upload files um, and then the students and I can watch a video together and then we can um, you know we can we can talk about it we I can bring up other diagrams and then we can also do some practice questions and they can ask me um, you know any any it can help problem-solve things for them um, and I had as many as 17 um, and there was about maybe an average of about five to ten each each week um, that the, like I said the highest number was 17 um, and it was it was just a really great experience and it allowed for a lot of a lot of um, really great learning to go on especially with some of the uh, more advanced students they took on a leadership role within uh, like they there was uh, two students in particular who became moderators and they would actually help the other students in the chat box while I was helping another student um, and you know it was just really really powerful to see um, the um, the confidence and the the knowledge that they have and to give them an area to to show this so uh, you know and something else I did with that was I uh, recorded them so that the students could then go back in the class and they have a, um, a password and a username and they can go back and any of the students even if they miss it they can watch the recording they can view the video they can hear us uh, talking back and forth they can download the files um, and it's just a really it's just a really great experience I'm looking forward hopefully in the near future um, you know to do something similar with Google Hangouts so we'll let you keep you keep you posted for that but now how how is all this received by your students parents um, I've had I've had uh, multiple parents be just you know just so they're so grateful um, for the you know the, the time um, the use of technology I've had a few parents who say you know you know I, I use uh, Adobe Connect with my work and this is awesome to see my kid you know learning this um, so everybody's just been really excited about it but that goes, you know, I, there was, you know, there was definitely a rollout period where I, I sent some informational letters home. Uh, I spoke about it on back to school night. Um, it wasn't just a surprise, um, you know, because because this part of what I'm doing, I could understand, could make people nervous, um, you know. So it's sort of, I don't have any broad recommendations uh, if people if districts were looking to implement something like this um, but I've been very fortunate to have the support of my administrators and you know I've kept them in the loop uh, the only advice I would have uh, for teachers that are trying to, to do this or interested is definitely be as transparent as possible um, invite your administrators in when you're starting um, so that they know you know they can get a clear idea of what what it exactly looks like um, you know and, and send send people the the um, contacts ahead of time um, so there you know it, it takes a lot of um, th thought process up front before you you know before it's as seamless as what I'm doing
Uh, Jasper, um, it looks like Sabrina had another question for you. Well, I'm glad that uh, Sabrina asked this because it's it's actually really uh, my my what I feel like is my duty. My really important message when I talk about this is, um, and I actually recently wrote an article for FlipLearning.com about this. Um, it's really heartbreaking to see. Uh, some of the videos that are out there that are being branded as flipped classroom um, because with all due respect they're really boring and it's heartbreaking to see because it's basically taking this uh, really powerful uh, technological capability and using it in a very old-fashioned way so the cons for this are um, you know it's really important to remember that this is something that's so exciting and new and it shouldn't be a, it shouldn't be a 20 it shouldn't be like it really shouldn't be any more than five minutes long um, but it shouldn't be the teachers direct instruction just captured on a video okay so some of the dangers of that are a kid who say a kid goes to a really forward-thinking school and all the teachers are doing this so they have you know whatever five classes and each teacher recorded their hour-long lecture, then they have to watch five hours of, of video at home. I mean, that's like, that's just a nightmare. Um, so, you know, the other, the other thing is, you know, kids and people in general have a really short attention span these days. So, you know, within the first minute or so, somebody's going to decide whether or not they want to watch your video. So it needs to be visually interesting. Um, you know, it needs to be relevant. Uh, so for people who are thinking about trying this, they really need to retool how they're, um, how they're introducing topics and, and discussing content. So there are many cons to this um, that are, you know, sort of not explored or talked about as much, but they're really important. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, actually, we had a question over here. So um, Jasper just mentioned, you know, kind of that old-fashioned way of doing Flip Classroom, and I think, you know, that's similar to, like, what you see with Khan Academy and things, like, videos like that. Um, both Danielle and I have math backgrounds, so we're just kind of curious, you know, what would be some thoughts on how to do something different in, like, the math, it, like, like, using math as, as an example. So I think that, you know, using it to help replace direct instruction and just kind of okay. change the timing and the pacing. Um, yeah, yeah, so like say say you're doing, uh, I guess it's trigonometry, right? Finding the lengths of uh, the lengths of triangles, right? Yep. Okay, so like, you know, go outside and find a tree and, you know, then you're you're outside and you could be, you know, you could pretend you're even a lumberjack, right? You could, you could do a little role playing and have suspenders and everything and Pretend you're Paul Bunyan. I don't know. I'm just thinking off the top of my head, right? And then you have somebody video you and where you're saying, oh, I'm a lumberjack. I want to cut this tree down and I want to know how tall it is. And then, you know, oh, there's the sun and you measure, you know, you have a long tape measure and you actually are measuring the shadows, right? And you just sort of, you know, rather than that screencast where you're watching my hand and a, and a pen do the, the triangle. Do you know what I'm saying? So, you know, it just it's just sort of like an idea of, of sort of, making it a little bit more like a story, um, taking kids places, um, and, and sort of just going out of that textbook sort of whiteboard framework. This is where I wish I had those pictures that I uh, took those stills of you that time where you had the beard or the fake beard and the... <laughs> I'll, be ha I'll, be happy. I, I, uh, I'll be happy to share some of these videos out um, when I get a minute, so... Um, you also you also recorded your you recorded some of your personal trips that your students would not be able to go on. Definitely. So um, in in uh, in the, today's uh, budgetary tight budgetary environment, uh, field trips can be really limited or non-existent, um, and so and also you know security issues and all that stuff. Um, I've found that videos are just a great way to um, basically 
allow me to go like you know for example when my when I took my family to uh, Niagara Falls I went to the museum I interviewed someone there and I made a eight minute or so video about with with the interview with one of the experts there we went to the falls we did a little video there um, and ta just talked and showed them a little bit about it um, we went to house caverns I went you know down in the bottom of house caverns and we did a little video um, I've gone to the you know Rochester I've gone to some museums that are interesting um, you know so field trips are just a great opportunity um, whenever you encounter anything in your content area or otherwise um, that you can share on video you know you could also do it uh, just by by photographs you know you don't have to start fresh I'm sure everybody has a photograph collection and you probably have all gone somewhere that's related to something in education and you could you could make a slideshow um, and then you know there's some apps or photo editing capabilities that you could add some captions on the pictures if you wanted um, so you could always do more of a static um, you know diagram based uh, that, I, that I actually do that a lot with my phone to um, some of the web apps um, but the uh, the video that Jesse was uh, mentioning was one that I you know I now that I'm really comfortable with it, I've actually sort of gone out of my comfort zone a little bit, and I, I made two new video series. Actually, I made three new video series this year. Uh, one was uh, Video Journal, Who Am I? And that one is uh, I pretended to be a historical figure. And uh, I'll, 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 uh, I'll provide the link, so I won't, I won't uh, tell you who I was, but I, I, uh, I did a little role playing of uh, pretending I was a historical figure, and... Um, gave some clues for my students to uh, to figure out who I was uh, so that was one I did um, I started a new one uh, video journal where am I uh, so I'm starting to go to different places in New York State and give some geological and um, astronomical clues and my students can use their earth science reference tables to try to figure out where I am um, and then I also started one uh, cooking with Jasper senior where I dress up as a as a chef and um, I cooked mashed potatoes to demonstrate surface area, how smaller pieces of potato have more surface area and cook quicker. Um, so, you know, and, and that's sort of, you know, that's a great example right there because I, I have, I've explained that in, in 10 years of teaching, I've explained how cutting up a potato makes the surface area greater. I've explained it, it feels like a million times. Um, so I finally, I took a little time and I made a video of it and you know, it caught everybody's attention and the kids that watched it they they get the idea now because they actually can see it Jasper we have a couple questions on the group chat uh, both from Christina and Paul yeah so Christina wants to know and so does Paul what do you do for students that don't have internet access at home and basically I think they're asking about your management techniques when you're using the videos okay so um, you know, first of all, the district that I work in um, is very fortunate. I'm very fortunate because the geographic area and socioeconomically, um, there's 100% broadband access. For the rare times um, in the years where there's been students who, you know, either they lose their internet access or they move or whatever, um, you know, they can use the computer in the classroom anytime. They can come in before school or after school. I'm always available before or after school for them to use the, the computers. Um, but class class time, when they're watching the videos, uh, you know, it's basically, it's basically up to them um, to, you know, to, um, if that's, if that's part of the menu that they're working on, that they, you know, they, they have their headphones, some of them will go out in the hallway um, and they'll, they'll just quietly you know, watch the video and ask me any questions if they have it. So I think that's an important thing to highlight. So if I'm understanding you correctly, and I remember sitting in your session, once you hand out that uh, menu of things that you need to get done and the students pick the times that they're going to do it, you've really moved yourself, and this is why it makes you a very unique flipped teacher, is that you've gone completely constructivist and you are now a facilitator and the students are the ones who are taking the lead in their education. Is that what you would say? Definitely, definitely. And then so at the end of the week, whatever is graded 
like a quiz, we'll go into the grade book, um, and I, this it, well, we'll go into the grade book, and then if the student hasn't done it, it's a zero until they make it up. So, and that's a really important distinction. Um, basically, I allow the students as really as much time as they need to get it done. Um, you know, with the only real requirements being the end of the quarter or the end of the year. And can you also, unless anybody has any questions before I move on to one of my questions, because I'm talking a lot and I want to make sure every participant gets an opportunity. Uh, Christina wants to make sure, do you teach earth science or how do you deal with labs? Like, do you mean dealing with like collecting them or dealing with like doing them? I'm sure she's going to put a response in. Ah, oh, there we go. They're really very rarely doing the labs at the same time. So I'll have, you know, when I when I hand when I hand out the weekly menu, it's cool for me. I, I love it. It's so intellectually stimulating for me because I'll hand the weekly menu out and then kids will literally be doing half a dozen or a dozen different things. So when I hand that weekly menu out on Monday, the lab materials for that week, if we're doing a lab, are already set up in the appropriate locations, and the kids who are selecting to do that will just go and do it. Um, usually they'll have to watch a video first, but they'll watch the video first, and then they'll go do it. Um, so they're, kids, are, kids in my room are very rarely doing all the same thing at once. Do you ever have any standouts that go through all the labs that are usually done with everything? Um, for everyone else. Well, I don't put I don't put all the labs out at once. You know, it's like it's it's um I've been since I've been doing this for two years, the asynchronous, I've I've come up with a really good balance for the amount of work for them to do. Um, but those kids that finish, it's ama it's really amazing. The kids that finish early are those ones that were on my online office hours who were helping the other students. So they actually will go around and help other students. Any questions from any of the other participants? Okay, one of the things I wanted you to... Oh, go ahead, please. Sorry, I have a question. So if you were going to speak to a teacher about um, flipping their classroom and you wanted, them to provi you wanted to provide them with a, a toolkit or a toolbox, per se, what would be in that box? You know, I know you said Ensemble and you mentioned Adobe Connect, but like to get started, what would be some key things that a teacher should really have in her box of tricks? Um, well, I would definitely recommend Screencast-O-Matic. Thank you. Let's see. So, I just typed it out there. So, um, Screencast-O-Matic, and um, that that's really great uh, for any platform, like if, especially if you don't have a Mac. Um, so that's that's a great recording tool, and that's a great place to start. Because um, normally a teacher that would be excited or interested about this would be a teacher who already probably has PowerPoints. So you could encourage them to uh, narrate one of their PowerPoints, and you could use Screencast-O-Matic. And Screencast-O-Matic, if you're not familiar with it, is a really easy, free, uh, I believe it's Java-based tool um, where you um, you can subscribe. I've subscribed to the the yearly membership for it, so the watermark comes off. You get a few more features, but you don't have to do that. Um, you have just a little watermark at the bottom. Um, but you can you can export it into a video file, uh, you know, multiple types of video files, and then upload it to wherever you wanted it to be. Um, so that 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 I would recommend uh, for a basic, you know, first try. Um, you know, because a lot of people aren't comfortable um, being videotaped, like their face and stuff. So starting off with your voice, doing something like that would be would be something I would recommend. And I know with the with the Mac you can do that with Keynote really easily as well. And what do you think would be easiest for a new teacher to use as far as hosting their site? Um, well, it, I mean, it depends. You know, a lot of schools around here have have their own, ho you know, hosted sites. So I, 
I would really, you know, this is a great opportunity to talk about uh, my path on this. Um, last year, in my end of the year student surveys, one of the things, the, the, the more negative comments I got was that I was too spread out over the internet. There were too many places for the kids to go. So this year, I really, really, really consolidated and made my teacher website on the Lakeland School District basically the one stop shopping for all my resources. So that was like the main place for the kids to go. Um, so wherever you choose, make sure that it, it's a one starting place for everything that you do. I mean, I know, I know some teachers use uh, Blogger and that, you know, that's, that's fine. There's a way to get rid of the, um, the bar at the top that you can click to the next blog. And I would recommend doing that in an educational setting because um, you're never sure what the next blog is going to be. Um, I believe that's in the template or the layout setting. Um, but basically just warehousing everything in one spot would be what I would recommend, whatever you choose. Now, I also wanted to just uh, follow up. So you have an end of the year student survey. Yeah. I'm not sure how many teachers have done that. Could you talk a little about that? Sure. Um, so what I... What I what I'm doing is I basically at the end of the year I want to know I want to know how I'm doing, um, and I want to know it from my students. So it's it's just fascinating. Last year was the first year that I really did something formal like this, um, and the idea is I gave a I gave an anonymous survey a week before the Regents, so their grade their grade wouldn't impact how they were. Uh, responding um, and so I got some really valuable feedback that I you know I spent my summer really thinking about um, and it's one of the one of the big impacts on me in terms of the amount of homework that I gave because one of the one of the things was that the students said was that I really I jammed them up with a lot of homework so this year I gave substantially less homework from that um, but then the other you know one of the other things was that uh, the idea of the um, consolidating everything onto one site was really was really help, was was I got that from there. Um, I see Paul uh, chiming in. It's cool to see that you do them too. I, I didn't I didn't have the parents do that, although that might be something in the future um, that I that I do incorporate. Um, but. Basically, you know, I really, I really want to know. I really wanted to know what the effect of this was. Um, so actually, like moving forward, I'm actually start embarking on. It's kind of an ambitious project, but I'm starting to do um, an action research project next year, where I'm going to be incorporating these student surveys into a, a larger, bigger picture. Um, sort of initiative with some standards based grading that's something that I've become really interested in um, but again just that idea you know it, it really boils down to in my classroom how the students feel and how they perceive their learning is really important to me and a lot of the times it's more important than the grade that they get um, Jasper can you also talk about the fact that you don't have a desk in your uh, classroom Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, it's actually rare that I'm sitting down like this in such a comfortable chair because uh, a few years ago I decided to get rid of my desk, um, and I, I basically it started as I wanted to just like get a little more exercise, and it morphed into this really really powerful concept of you know what a teacher's desk means to a student. Um, because after even like a day or two, the kids the kids were asking me, "Where's your desk?" You know, and so I started asking them, "Well, you know, what does a desk mean to you?" You know, and and they all said back to me, "It's a really private space. That's the teachers, and we don't go on that." Hmm. And that's not the the feeling I want in my classroom. I want my classroom. I want kids to come in. I want them to be excited. I want them to want to be there. I want it to be ours, you know. So what I did was I, I, I ditched the desk. I gave my colleague my really comfortable chair, and um, 
And then what I did was I just basically, this was part of digitizing all of my resources. You know, I don't have any piles of paper around. I just circulate constantly. And, you know, like you know, my pictures of my family and stuff are facing outwards. Um, all the stuff, there's like a demonstration table because it's a science classroom. Um, and I have, I had them install the smart board on the side. So there's actually no front to the classroom anymore. And, and then I'm always constantly circulating around. And then I either use um, my iPad or I use one of the desktop, I use the desktop computer that's on the smart board um, as, you know, my workstation if I'm, if I'm taking attendance or something like that. Um, but I'm always mobile. And so that way I can have basically multiple conferences with each student every day, which is just so powerful because there's no kid that's just sitting there, you know, not engaged. And that's the, that's the number one comment that administrators have when they come to visit me is that, you know, wow, those kids were really engaged for the entire time. I personally think that is so cool. Um, any comments or questions from the participants? Caroline, you've been awful quiet there. you have any observations or uh, questions for Jasper? And this, is, this is great, Jennifer. Now, I don't have any questions. Um, my comment is more that I did PD with teachers, and I'm starting to think about flipping that PD with them, so I give them a little bit of learning before I even come in and work in the classroom. So just some of those insights on what, what things to use. It's a lot different than working with students on a daily basis, but that's sort of where I'm coming from right now. I would have to chime in exactly with where Carolyn's at too because uh, I am the same way. I do professional development and your model, Jasper, is uh, a really great model for me to use to even make sure that people have the prerequisite knowledge before they come in for a session. Um, and the floor is open for any discussion. Please don't feel like uh, you only have to ask a question. If you have any observations or anything that you thought was uh, really uh, cool, please go ahead and state them. Well, being you know, being from the other side of the uh, professional development equation as a as a teacher, I personally would really appreciate that because a lot of the time, you know, I in in this is just like the students, you know, ninety nine percent of the teachers that you're presenting for or doing professional development for are willing participants. They do want to get something done. They realize that their time is valuable and meaningful, and they they want to participate. But a large chunk, just like the students a large chunk of the initial time is going to be spent figuring out what they're supposed to be doing. So, you know, having, having them be able to be able to, to view content ahead of time. And, and then, and also it's just, you know, the gears are turning in their heads be, you know, the day or two or th even three days before. So they're thinking about it and then they can make an informed, uh, they can, they can speak eloquently about it. They can, they can have an opinion rather than just sitting there going, well, I just heard about this. I have no, I have to think about it, you know? Um, but again, with professional development as well, all those sort of like guidelines might apply too. You want to make sure it's viewable to everybody. You know, you can't just send them a, fi a, a file and expect their computer to, to run it. You know, you need to host them somewhere, mm -hmm. maybe even password protected because it would be, you know, whatever. Um, I was just thinking off the top of my head, but you know, you want to you want to make them interesting. You want to have them varied um, delivery um, and all that. You know, to keep people's interest as well. I think uh, also one of the things that you touched on that um, Jesse, Serena, and I had touched on. We started hanging out together. That's where the whole idea for doing these hangouts came up with because our discussions that happen when. Um, you are in that environment, then you're also pre-informed or very organic and they just, you know, begin to develop and, and the whole idea of doing a hangout on flipped instruction is, is just another example of that. I really like the idea also that um, you know as well as I do from both uh, being a teacher and now as a staff developer that the one thing that you don't want to do is waste a teacher's time because there's just, there's not enough of it. Yeah, uh, you know, and if you take the time, I think to um, to really make whatever time they have with you as valuable as possible, um, I think that the response would be really good. What do Definitely. you think, Caroline? 
I, I agree 100%. Um, I just am having an experience taking sort of an online course for one, from one of our vendors, and it's, it's not exciting by any stretch of the imagination, but it's something that I only could have gotten traveling a long distance and staying overnight and going to a big workshop. And what I'm finding is that it's great for my learning style because I can skip some of the some of the PowerPoint slides that I know about or that maybe are a re review, but I can also go back and listen to listen to whatever the woman had said as she's going through analyzing reports. I didn't quite get that. Let me rewind a little. Let me watch it again. Like maybe maybe come back to it the next day. So I think that that piece of enabling teachers or students to rewatch something that they didn't understand the first time and I can look at it as many times as I need to because students and teachers not everybody's learning at the same pace so something that I might get right away and never need to hear from you again somebody else might need to hear it a couple of times or see it a couple of times a couple of different ways so I think that's one of the benefits for both students and teachers I would I would definitely agree um, that's one of the number one um, positive comments that I got from my students in my survey was that um, they could they could definitely you know rewind it they could pause it they could watch it again um, if students are absent they can they can watch the content um, I even have students who are not you know on my roster they're um, you know medically excused students um, they're getting their instruction from my videos, which is just really exciting, and it, it, it feels great to be able to be so helpful for people. Um, and I'm starting to get emails and, and comments from uh, students and teachers around New York State that are using my Earth Science videos, which is just, it just feels great to be able to, you know, be so helpful to so many people where in a more traditional manner I would, you know, what I said at the beginning, at the in the front of the class, is basically essentially lost, you know, mm -hmm. afterwards. And you know, who knows if kids are listening anyway? You know, it's it's like, you, you know, so it's it's just really nice in that accessibility uh, piece for for everybody. Sabrina and I were just chatting on the side that we still want to get a trip together to go visit your class. Definitely. It, you know, it's, it's time sort of ran out this year uh, for it, but we'll definitely, definitely plan for one early next year. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd love that. So, Yeah, and so would we. We try and get anybody together to go. It would be really cool, too, especially, like, you, you know, you can really see the power of it, uh, like, really early, you know, early in the year because the kids are so excited about it. Um, we had a chance, um, one of my classes last in November, uh, we video conferenced into the Nice Gate conference in Rochester, and it was, it was so exciting because we had the video conference unit in our classroom, and um, Linda Brandon was there presenting, and um, so she was presenting and talking a little bit about what I'm doing, and it was just so cool to be able to to use technology to highlight it. And they sort of zoomed around and, and looked at what we were doing, and then. Um, it was just so cool because, you know, people, it's nice to be that people want to hear what I have to say, but it's even more powerful to see what my students have to say. So mm -hmm. during that conference, the participants in Rochester were able to actually um, interview my students um, and hear about their perspective on it. Um, so I'd definitely love to share that with you guys, too. We have a nice question from Sabrina in the chat. Do uh, parents request you as their teacher? Because I am a Lakeland parent, and you know that I'm going to request you for my son if I need to. Well, that will be really uh, wonderful. That's a nice compliment. Thank you. Um, I actually, you know, I don't really know that much. I don't uh, get that involved in the scheduling. Um, I do have uh, siblings, you know, uh, so I don't know if they request it or not. Um, but we don't, I don't really hear that much about it, so... And what grades do you teach, Jasper? I teach eighth grade. Yeah, so my son's just entering kindergarten, so you have to stay put in Lakeland <laughs> at least until then. Well, it's so exciting. I mean, who, you know, that's, so that's seven or eight years, you know, it's, it's so exciting. Who even knows what, you know, what we'll be talking about, about then. But it's, one thing is for sure, it's a really exciting time to be in education because there's just so many possibilities to, make it more meaningful, 
make it more relevant and make it more exciting for students. Um, and you know, it, I, I really see it as a as an obligation as an educator to to you know get this done because it's really really important. Uh, before I, we open up for any closing comments, I also want to say, you know, I really respect you for making your class as student-centered as possible. And some of the things that you talked about really raise very powerful questions for any educator. Um, you know, like I have done how am I doing surveys when I work at a uh, summer camp. Uh -huh. And I've always wanted to do them in my classes, but, you know, I have to say that yeah, I was a little frightened to do them in my classes because of what I might hear, where I might be falling short, how could I better serve my students. Uh, and so I really respect you for doing that and also taking your desk out of there. I mean, that is such, um, a, you would think small change because it's a physical change, but just like you said, the implications for the students, that that is a private space that is the teachers when in fact the classroom is really about them. And I really respect you a lot for doing that. Thank you. Yeah, I've, I uh, I wouldn't say I've gotten any like you know face to face pushback on my desk, but you know I, I do have had people in casual conversation, you know, jokingly say they would never do that, um, just because you know that's not how they how they teach, you know, and and those are those are the classrooms where the desks are all in rows, and you know, there's a different style of teaching going on. Um, but, do you get do you get some of the, I've experienced in the past, I'm sure anybody who's involved in technology at some point has experienced in the past, well, why are you doing all of that from well, that's colleagues? A good, you know, that's a great, that's a great closing, closing, uh, closing question because it's, it's something that's really coming, you know, coming to the, to the tip of my tongue while I'm thinking more about all this. And it, it comes down to me, to the essential idea that professional development is is each individual teacher's responsibility. Um, it's not that it's not that professional development in districts is bad, but there's learning happens all the time, and therefore, I believe that it's every every educator's responsibility to be constantly learning all the time. So that's why I do it is because I love learning, and I love being the best that I can be for my students. Um, and I just, I have a natural love of learning and doing new things, so it's its just, it's exciting to me. I couldn't do the same thing for 30 years with the same worksheets. It's just not who I am. Yeah, Sabrina, that's a great observation. <laughs> uh, we're, Sabrina just mentioned that you probably have a lot less emails and phone calls than well, from parents. It's a double-edged sword because, you know, like I mentioned in my 24-7 uh, presentation, I am accessible all the time. So I do get a lot of emails, um, but I'm able to deal with them right away. So the interaction, you know, the um, happiness quotient, I guess you would say, is, is higher um, because I'm able to deal with them right away. Um, and I, 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 like that, I like that open communication. I, I actually hope to increase that more through social media in the future. Um, but this year especially every single interaction I've had with parents and guardians has been only positive um, so it's it's just again I think that ties back to being you know going really above and beyond to really be as transparent as possible is really helpful that's awesome oh good question it, well, I didn't do any any formal research on this, um, but the oh, so let's just say for the audience what Sabrina's question was. Yeah, so talking about my test scores, um, you know, and, and test scores are a fact of life. Um, and so last year was my first full year of doing uh, flipped video instruction, and I had the highest earth science region scores in my district, um, and 100% mastery on the regions. So. You know, those results, if you're a results only person, the results spoke for themselves. Um, I'd only had 100% mastery one other time. So. That's amazing. So, you know. Any so, other. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jasper. So, I, you know, so I was just saying that, you know, last year was sort of an experiment. Um, but, you know, if, if you're looking at grades as being something that, you know, shows the validity of this instructional method. 
um, then, you know, my students' grades definitely represented that. And they had 50 students taking the Regents last year. So it was a, it was a fairly robust sampling size. That's fantastic. Any other comments before we uh, end? So Jasper, your suggestions were that uh, Screencast-O-Matic is a great place to get started. Yeah. Everything should be yeah. located centrally into one place, right? Yep. yep. Um, also, keep the videos short and keep them interesting. This is not the place to take your entire lecture and no. put it up online. My, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share out the, um, some of the links that I talked about. Um, I apologize that I didn't have those ready for you. Um, but, um, you know, I really wanted to title my, my article that I wrote for fliplearning.com, you know, don't be the boring video guy, you know, or something, <laughs> something like that. But we wanted to keep it, the title a little bit more positive, you know, but just really, you know, video can be so boring. So just, you know, really use it wisely. Thank you so much. So any other comments around the room before we end? Well, thank you so much, Jasper. This is probably one of the best hangouts that we've had. I've learned so much. Oh, well, you're very welcome. It's my pleasure. I, I love talking about this stuff, and you guys are a fantastic group of people. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, after, you know, in the evening probably I'll go through the um, Today's Meet um, transcript. Um, and then also if people are interested in a more in like because I can we can talk on there and then also on Twitter is a great way to reach me or on Google Plus um, I'm very Googleable and that's uh, you know something else we could talk about another time but uh, I, you know I like I said at the beginning I looked at this as just the beginning of a great conversation that I, I'm hoping that we can continue to have oh and Jasper when you're talking about professional development would you say the place where you go the most for professional development is Twitter yeah definitely and everyone's excited about the class trip. I have a feeling that we're going to have quite a few representatives from different districts, so I'll go on your class trip. Great, and hopefully we can we can get the approval to do some sort of streaming on that for the people who uh, can't join us. That would be great. Fantastic. All right, thank you so much, Jasper. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure. I'm looking forward to, to talking more in depth with, uh, with everybody about this. So if you have any questions, definitely feel free to reach out. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thanks, bye, Jasper. Take care, everybody. All right. Have a great day, Thank everybody. You. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Bye, Jasper. Anytime. Day. Enjoy the rest of the day, everyone. Little. Yep. Yeah.